Hello and welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. And I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist. And I'm so excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. Now today, something different on the show. Normally it's either me talking about some topic that's eating disorder related or I'm interviewing one of my wonderful guests. But this week I'm actually going to share a conversation that I had recently with Shane Walsh Fitness on his podcast. So Shane is the founder of Shane Walsh Fitness and he got into fitness after being really unwell and it was really a route back to health in terms of transforming his mental and physical health and now he's incredibly passionate to help others do the same. Now Shane is a fully qualified nutritionist and he specializes in working with females and educating them on how to fuel their body and move away from those crazy 1200 calorie diets that were once recommended for all. So Shane is hugely passionate about promoting a healthy relationship with food, moving away from good and bad foods and developing a positive relationship with body image and promoting joyful active movement. So I hope that you enjoy this interview where Shane um, was talking to me and all of Shane's details are in the show notes if you want to find out more about the work he does. So let's get to the conversation. Hey guys and welcome to the next episode of the Shane Walsh Fitness Podcast. So today is episode 203. So today is a very special episode and this is someone that I have been kind of following for a while and trying to build up and build up to kind of press the, the send button to kind of get Harriet on. But today is a, an episode with Harriet Fruit. So Harriet is the eating disorder therapist underscore in between all those words on Instagram. Harriet is an experienced counsellor who specialises in supporting people to overcome disordered eating, find peace with food and host of the amazing The Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. And she's a trainer in eating disorders and body image. And Harriet offers online courses, training and in an individual breakthrough days as well. Harriet approaches anti-diet and promotes a healthy relationship with food and your body. And Harriet has had her own struggles in her teens as well. So she's coming from a place of she knows what she's been going through. And Harriet works with the psychology of, of disordered eating, helping you to understand your story and then supporting you in learning the skills, habits and behaviors to find peace with food and then live your life. So if anyone's interested in working with Harriet, she has a website, which is the eating disorder therapist.co.uk. And you can also message her on Instagram. So some of the topics that we kind of talk about today, because the reason why I've had the likes of the amazing Jamie Wright on on and the likes of Harriet on recently talk about kind of eating disorders and binge eating and stuff is that unfortunately it is quite rife at the minute. And a lot of people haven't dealt with a lot of things for quite a while. And the pandemic is making people struggle and open up and or kind of shut down and it, it, it's not it's not nice to watch and I wanted this platform being able to give people and provide the service to them to be able to say guys there are there is hope and it's important to kind of make sure you do go and reach out for that help no one no man or woman is an island and it's important to reach out so some of the topics that we talk about are what are the main eating disorders that are out there and what are the different classifications we talk about kind of like the issue with the main classifications of having this eating disorder and the purging and that side of things the importance of getting root to the root cause of your disorder we we also talk about where to start with your recovery we talk about kind of five five binge triggers and how to stop them and if you want to listen back to a full episode that she had uh, that harriet recorded was back in november on this also we talk about supporting a loved one with an eating disorder we also talk about if your if your offspring or your kids or whatever maybe you're a developer are having issues with food, how to kind of help them to build a healthy relationship with food. We talk about kind of helpful tips to improve relationship with food and body image, and we also talk about why do we think there's a rise in disordered eating amongst men during this weird time. I think there's a stigma attached to that unfortunately that girls only struggle with this, but during the pandemic I think there's a sixty percent rise in. Eating, eating disorders amongst men and 
it's important that this is uh, listened to. So it's really, really important that whoever's listening to this, and if you are struggling or you're in that position, to go and please talk to someone. You are not alone. The services are out there. You will not be judged. It, the first step is going to be difficult. It will be difficult to do it. But I would highly encourage you to make sure that you are living the best life you can possibly do. There is help out there if you wish to look for it. So I hope you enjoy the episode with Harriet Fruit. Harriet, thank you so much for, for coming on today. Oh, thanks for inviting me, Shane. Great to be here. I've been following Harriet for quite a while and I know one of the a couple, a couple of the previous guests uh, I know you've spoken to uh, as well and they're kind of definitely recommending to to get you on. I think with what's happening at the minute, it was it's hugely important that we do kind of talk about disordered eating because amongst males, I think it's like 60% increase in Ireland anyway uh, with eating disorders. So it is, it's unfortunately up on, on the rise. I think this is a hugely important episode. So Harriet, can you kind of talk us through like your background, how you kind of got into this field, um, and then we can kind of we can kind of go from there. Sure. Yeah. Um. So, hi. I'm an eating disorder therapist, and um, I got into this field very much as a wounded healer. Um. I had experienced myself a need of an eating disorder when I was 17. So, it started off with um sort of strict diets, um, and quite a lot of stress was going on at home. But um, yeah. Basically, I had a brief spell of anorexia that quite quickly developed into bulimia. And um, back then, there really wasn't much help available at all. So I decided quite early on, I went off traveling by myself when I was 23 and um, went to Australia. Um, Yeah, many Australia, sort of, you know, like doing the kind of backpacking thing. Um, Yeah, went to um, do some Camp America stuff as well, which was really great. But yeah, when I took that year out, I really decided, oh, what I want to do is, um, I was still recovering them myself from bulimia, but I decided I wanted to sort of support others. And um, I very much, you know, kind of went into it with a real kind of passion, wanting to kind of change the world in a slightly kind of naive way. But also, um, you know, I think it's kind of kept me going and sort of driven me to sort of do what I do today. So then I've worked in eating disorders um, in the National Health Service in England um, and also in private practice for many years. Um, and I've more recently got much more into sort of social media, podcasting, and yeah, just sort of spreading messages really about recovery. So that's like a brief overview of my background. <laughs> I've given I've given a little bit more in the in the little mm-hmm. intro that I, I gave you at the beginning. You talk about kind of like anorexia and bulimia. What are the main differences between the main types of eating disorders that are out there? Sure. So, I mean, anorexia, I guess, is the one that everyone has heard of a lot. And that's when people tend to, you know, they've gone very strict diets and um, lose a lot of weight. Um, often if they're female, they're losing their periods, male and female lose their sex drive. You know, there's a strong preoccupation with becoming smaller. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's, you've developed a very disordered relationship with food to start to really restrict, often over-exercise, you might start purging. Um, obviously, anorexia is the eating disorder that is well known, but actually 85% of people with eating disorders are actually normal weight or overweight. And so I think that's a really important message to get out there because people often think, oh, I don't have anorexia. I'm not emaciated. I'm not underweight. So I I don't relate to that kind of eating disorder thing. Um, So that's anorexia nervosa. And bulimia nervosa, again, someone is really wanting to restrict, lose weight, strong focus on weight and shape. Um, but they will go through periods of restriction and and um, and then will go through have periods of binge eating and then compensation through purging, which could be self-induced vomiting, laxatives or overexercise. And um, often people with bulimia can be normal weight or overweight. So it's often a sort of very shameful and um, secretive and hidden illness. Then there's binge eating disorder. Again, periods of restriction, periods of binging, but without purging. Um, so quite similar to bulimia, but without the purging element. Um, and that's definitely probably seen more commonly as well in sort of adults. Um, I think it's quite rife sort of in the fitness industry as well, but is um, probably not often sort of talked about or is perhaps even seen as kind of like an, a normal part of, you know, if, if you're in that kind of gym world. And then if you don't fit nice and neatly into any of those categories, you are OSFED, which is other specified eating and feeding disorder. And that basically means that you might meet certain diagnostic criteria from the other eating disorders, but you don't fit nice and neatly into a box. And actually, most people will probably fall into OSFED. So I guess, again, really important message that 
if, if you don't even identify sometimes with um, fitting neatly into diagnostic criteria for uh, an eating disorder, you know, you might well fall into OSFED and actually you're still very worthy of treatment. Your symptoms are very valid. You should still be seeking help. But that's like a whistle top stop tour. Why do you think that the, the numbers have gone up so high in the amount of people that are kind of like looking for help in relation to the eating disorders during this kind of weird time that we've been in for the last, feels like a long time, but the, like the last 15, 16, 17 months? Well, I think, you know, obviously COVID has been an incredibly stressful time. Um, I think people have been so isolated. They haven't been able to engage in their more kind of normal, healthy ways of kind of managing their emotions, connecting with others. Um, you know, people have been often stuck at home, haven't they? Or maybe stuck sometimes in relationships where they haven't been um, the most kind of nurturing or helpful. Um, you know, we've lost all our kind of interaction of going outside the home. People haven't been able to do their kind of hobbies. There's been so much anxiety around. Um, and I think as well, many people were probably sort of teetering on the edge of an eating disorder, um, but probably functioning with their head above water. And then I think when COVID hit, they very quickly went under because they maybe already had disordered eating patterns. Maybe they were being a bit restrictive. Maybe they might have binged occasionally. But then with all that stress that suddenly came in with COVID and um, things, I think, then really quickly unraveled. Um, so, yeah, I think I think a real mix of things um, with, with, you know, in the last few months. I think what like I know the the content that you put out is so it's very visual with the, the you put it quite visual on your on your descriptions and stuff and one of the posts that you put up was the importance of getting to the root of your disorder and I'm gonna let you try and talk that through a little bit more. Sure, well, I guess it's like the kind of classic phrase that's often sort of flagged around. It's not about food; it's about feelings. Yeah, and yeah. So I, I guess eating disorders are coping strategies, and um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because some people develop an eating disorder; someone else might develop a problem with alcohol or workaholism or, or something else. So the, the the eating part is the symptom, and I guess underneath the eating disorder you know it is a way of coping and no one actually wakes up one day and thinks ah I'm gonna like you know use food to feel better but I think in a culture that we live in when there's so many messages about kind of change how you look you're going to feel better lose weight you're going to get validation if you don't feel good about yourself and it can be a very seductive path to go down because of I guess usually as well initially when people lose weight people praise them validate them they get more attention they feel they're doing something really good and um, when you're very focused on food it's a way of sort of distracting and numbing from difficult feelings so if other areas of your life are quite stressful if you focus on food exercise whatever it can sort of simplify your life right down so you do feel like you know I'm kind of in control I'm kind of dealing with this and it kind of distances you from more painful things um, become a bit as well part of identity you know um, if you can be kind of known as like the really fit person yeah. um, and that can be quite hard to let go of um, so yeah all different kind of ways of coping really but I guess that, you know often the root is like kind of an emotional thing if you peel back the layers and um, there's often some sort of emotional pain there um, you know and it doesn't necessarily have to be um, you know, significant trauma or, you know, something really terrible. I mean, it could be, I don't want to like, you know, yeah, yeah. obviously some people have been through that, but often it's just that maybe you haven't got the best coping strategies in place for managing your emotions. Because I think as well in our, in our culture, we're not brought up often to have a healthy relationship with our emotions. So, you know, you can often like go through coping with like, you know, putting on a brave face in a way, feeling like, maybe I don't have to engage with the emotional side of life to a certain point. But then I think when stresses in life add up, it gets to a kind of tipping point. And that's when you can be vulnerable to using a coping strategy. And, and one of those coping strategies could be an eating disorder. Is the information being put out or even the information in schools and stuff improving in that directive? Because I know it's kind of like, I know when I grew up, it was kind of like, girls where you look at magazines and stuff and that's generally like the media and stuff kind of control our or what's cut our feed and create our feed and stuff like I grew up with the likes of Kate Moss being kind of like the pinnacle and then before that was kind of like Marilyn Monroe and they were kind of going down more the Jen Selter or the J-Lo look with kind of like the bigger glutes the bigger quads 
are the schools on the education system you can only speak for the UK system or whatever it may be, or have an opinion on it, but are they doing enough to kind of protect the next generation? Because I don't think I'd like to be growing up in this generation. Yeah, no, I mean, I think they're not doing enough. Um, I mean, I think it's so tricky because I think things are accelerating so fast with the exposure to social media and everything our young people go through. I think it's perhaps quite hard for schools to have kept up with it. Um, you know, I think, I mean, I know I've got three teenagers and, um, you know, they do get a lot more input now on mental health, you know, focusing on feelings, self-care, self-esteem. So that is all really, really positive. So I think, you know, you don't want to kind of completely knock schools. Yeah. Um, but I think as well in parallel with that, it's still very much a message in schools about kind of healthy week and sugar is bad. And, um, you know, and then the kind of government comes out with things, um, you know, very much kind of sort of tackling people I guess they feel are overweight and should be kind of you know eating less and moving more um you know and that, I guess that might be part of an overall package of care that someone may be helpful for someone but I think it, it really sort of over the, the mental health side is completely yeah. overlooked because so many people that are struggling with binge eating or problems with their weight or whatever they've got some psychological stuff going on, whether they're aware of it or not. And they can't just suddenly change their symptom behavior, you know, and they actually feel so much shame for that. So so I've gone off the original question a bit, really. But I think I think schools need to do a lot more. But I think as well, um, it's really we always need a bit of an overhaul as a society. Like I think, you know, as parents and stuff we're seeing on the media, we need to have like mental health so far up the agenda from really, really young. Yeah. So we're not exposing kids as well to sort of so many diet culture messages. So I think at the moment, so much of that is done in an unconscious way, almost like a religion we've been following for years. You know, people say things and um, without even realising the impact it's having on their children because there hasn't been the awareness. And, and I think things are changing. And I think the younger generation growing up, Gen Z, are so proactive, you know, really speaking out a lot more, doing some fantastic work. So I think things are changing and improving, but probably just not at quite a fast enough rate. Um, do you think the taboo or the stigma is still attached to the disorders and, the, the, and that kind of thing? Because... I know when, say, if you're like out for a meal or when you can go out for a meal and stuff like that, and you're like, I don't know, like my food is ice cream, like my ice cream is life. And you're potentially like, you're meant to be like the nutritionist or the PT in inverted commas. Like, are you sure you can have that? Those kind of sentences. Do you still think that the kind of like the stigma is kind of rife? And is there anything, is, is that going to change anytime soon? Or is it possible that it can change? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really possible it can change. You have to always be hopeful, don't we? But I mean, I think I work with a lot of people that work in the fitness industry and who work in nutrition and who just feel in this awful hole where they feel that's really struggling with disordered eating, but they feel so much shame and so much secrecy about that because of what they're putting out to the world, what they're working with with their clients is very much to... And promote, you know, really great health, exercise, all of those things. Um, so I think there's there's so much shame and secrecy, and I, I think it's probably even worse sometimes. You know, if you're a health professional, you feel, oh my goodness, I should really yeah. have my sort of stuff together, really. Um, so um, it's not the case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not the case, isn't it? But I mean, great. I think that we're just having more of these conversations because I think in the past people would have just felt, I can't even mention that really whereas I guess now I feel like more people do contact me and are able to to say that in a safe space so yeah th- th- no, things I, are shifting I think it's important that you did say that because about the kind of like the fitness industry because I think I've seen that myself from when I was working on the gym floor and stuff that there was an awful lot of like the people that I used to work with who have recovered and who were going through at the same time and then having the pressure to look a certain way in order to get clients because ultimately if you look a certain way to someone it's going to draw someone in but you may not be kind of like that's purely extrinsic but intrinsic could be an absolute you could be in a hole so it's like that pressure do I run a business or do I look after myself do I look a certain way to get business it's kind of like it's a double-edged sword for for a lot of those people 
Um, where to start with the recovery when you don't know really where to start? Because this is one of the most difficult things for an awful lot of people. Because as you've mentioned the word a good few times, there is unfortunately a lot of shame attached to the this kind of thing. You put up a post about kind of the five tips or where to start. Sure. So, I mean, I think the first thing is really just saying it out loud and telling someone because of I think often people will live, um, you know, I've worked with several clients actually that are struggling with eating disorders and, you know, significant disordered eating behaviours every day, such as purging, and they're living with a partner and the partner doesn't even know yeah. that is happening. And I think that's not completely uncommon. So I think um, obviously saying it out loud, saying it to someone that's trustworthy and that's going to be accepting, obviously that's really important. You don't want to be telling someone where you feel like you're going to not get a great response because that could just, you know, increase the shame even more. So yeah, telling someone, I think really, really important. Um, I think as well, then like looking into options for trying to get help. I mean, I think as well, what's great is there's so much more mental health awareness now so people are speaking out sometimes more, but then you go to your GP to get referred to eating disorder services um, and then there's waiting lists or, you know, it's not like a lovely, smooth process. Um, I mean, I like to say with that, things are changing in eating disorder services. There's a new initiative um, that's in the UK. I'm, I'm, sure in, I'm, I'm not sure if it's in Ireland as well, but in terms of it, it's called Freed um, and it's early intervention for eating disorders. So that's going to be, um, it's going to be an, a sort of, a normal thing soon that when you go to an NHS service, you're literally, particularly if you've had an eating disorder in the last, that's only developed in the last three years, you're picked up literally within a couple of weeks and starting to be seen. So obviously we're not there yet. Some services are there yet already with that, but it's a minority. So yeah, going to get help though. And I guess if you can afford it, um, private help, you know, I know perhaps many people feel like you shouldn't have to pay for private help, but I think as well, I know for myself, but like particularly my twenties, you know, I spent a lot of money on therapy, and um, you know, you know, people do spend a lot of on clothes, getting their nails done, all yeah. kinds of things, and I think that was such an investment in my long term, just sanity and how I feel about myself today, and you know, so it's like really seeing. I know perhaps people we shouldn't have to pay, but seeing it as an investment for the longer term, um, starting to engage as well with accounts on social media that are really sort of helpful and um, pro recovery. Um, maybe anti-diets possibly you know I, I think again I, I guess if you're in the fitness world um, you may there may be some kind of nuance around that but I think there's quite a lot of accounts out there which were which can kind of fit that kind of more middle ground as well but are, are focusing much more on like self-compassion managing your emotions having a healthy yeah. relationship with food um, so yeah I mean I think those are the main things really and you, you know it starts to believe in a way that recovery is possible I think many people start to think oh, this is something I've just got to live with. And then they sort of muddle along for a long time. And actually, you haven't. And actually, many eating disorders are treatable, you know. And, and I think the statistics that get sort of um, mentioned a lot about kind of, you know, that some people just will never recover. And I think as well, we're talking as well sometimes about the past when sadly people just didn't get the help they needed. You know, they'd be left for years without support. And then it becomes such a habit, so much part of identity that is much harder to change. But I think actually eating disorders are treatable conditions. You know, it's not a quick fix, but recovery is possible. What about the classifications? Because I know if someone hasn't, say, purged, which is the likes of getting, making themselves sick or taking the laxative, whatever it may be, in a certain time frame that means that they don't fall into a certain bracket. Is there an issue with the time, the kind of like the classifications of bulimia or anorexia or asthma? And, and if they have, haven't have purged in, I think, three, six months, I think it is, or whatever, maybe. Is there an issue with that? And like, because if someone hasn't fit into it and they have done it once in, say, six months, they ultimately still have the, the, the capacity to do it again, but they don't feel the support is there. So like that person could feel a little bit lost in the system, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And I think it just really shows the limits of diagnoses generally because of it's with everything, it's a spectrum, isn't it? It's not that yeah. someone's like neatly in a box or they're not really. It is a spectrum. I mean, I think probably what will happen more and more in the future is like at the moment, say, in, in NHS mental health services, you have sort of your community mental health team that deal with sort of perhaps the more intense and mental health issues. Then you also have like um, 
services that do what I'd call like kind of a bit lighter touch. I mean, it's still serious, you know, not wanting to not validate anyone's mental health problem, but it's more kind of accessible treatment that you can get into, you can self-refer to. And, um, you know, you'd still get like your 20 sessions or something of CBT. And I'm wondering as well with eating disorders down the line, because at the moment it tends to be very much like in NHS services, it's like people that are really, really unwell and they're not much, but many people that are still unwell that don't meet the diagnostic criteria. So we're almost needing, I think, that like second tier of services like you have for anxiety and depression in the NHS where people can still kind of access support. Um, but I suppose for the purpose of today, because that's not really available, um, it's just really saying to people, I think, that, you know, maybe you will have to get private help. But I just say as well, it, it's worth the investment. You know, just because you don't meet diagnostic criteria, don't think that means you don't have a problem. Because a lot of people have had a, the thought in the past, like, because I'm not low enough weight or I need to lose more weight than I don't have an eating yeah. disorder. So, yeah, it's like validating your symptoms, really. You know, even if, if you're purging, even like, twice a month or something but you don't meet diagnostic criteria purely for bulimia that's still a problem and you want to be getting help for that you don't want to just be normalizing that behavior i think you made an incredible point there previously and just reaffirmed it there with in relation to investing yourself now so that you can you can live the life that you want i think a lot of people don't want to do that they're more than happy to go and get like the latest headphones or go and get the latest handbag or holiday or whatever maybe and i'm all for people going like if you want to do staycations or whatever that's that's happy out but if you are in a fortunate position to be able to kind of like finance it like invest in yourself so you can like especially if someone's potentially looking to have kids or start a family it's really particularly for like lads as well but girls like if if the if the cycle and stuff is is getting turned off well then that's not mm. going to happen and stuff so it's, it's hugely important you mentioned about the words kind of like binge and stuff and i think it is important to like there is a massive there is a differentiation between a binge and emotional eating and i think a lot of people are very flippant with the word binge and yeah. i think that's potentially where the education system needs to be kind of worked on and the language because we all go to these negative words and negative connotations of food really quickly like way too quickly um what are kind of like you did an episode back in i think it was november on five binge triggers and how to kind of stop them can you kind of talk that, about that a little bit more yeah sure so i think i often think with a binge it's like a cu cumulative events that lead you up almost to the edge of the cliff where you jump off and have the binge yeah so a binge just doesn't come out of nowhere so one of the tips is really to start to just be much more self-aware and to recognize, you know, to start to have a bit more of a bird's eye view down on you. Um, so I think with binge eating, it's often driven by two main drivers. One is like physical and one is emotional. OK, so if you want to start managing binge eating and to reduce it, what you need to look at first is your physical and the physical side of things, you, you know, ha it, making sure that you are not restricting. And I know that sounds so simple, but it's not very easy if someone's in a pattern of restricting. But if you are restricting your food, you know, by delaying eating, not only eating enough calories, by missing out food groups, um, you will inevitably, doing that over a period of time, you're highly, highly like, likely to start in eating behaviours because it's almost a survival mechanism for us human beings. Um, and for anyone that sort of doubts that, if you want to go and like Google the Minnesota starvation study, you know, really helpful study done back in the 50s. These men were starved of food. They didn't have eating disorders. But when they were starved of food, they very quickly developed unhealthy relationship with food, very quickly started binge eating. And it just shows the power of restriction on the human body. So it's a fascinating study. And I think so helpful in a way that it was done when we didn't have social media yeah. um, you know, and all these other things. So it just shows what happens. Um, and there seems to be something that happens to the human brain as well. When you start to lose weight, you start to compare your body more to other people and you become more preoccupied with your own body independently of social media. So, yeah, tip number, yeah, major tip there is like eating regularly, starting to stabilize blood sugar, eating every two to three hours, not getting really over hungry. And um, that will really help to reduce the urge to binge. And you've almost got to do that first, because if you don't get your physiology stable, you're almost on a tightrope to deal with your emotions. So I sometimes say to people, you know, if you've got your physiology stable, regular eating, it's like you're on a nice, solid platform. Yeah. 
you know so when your emotions come in you're more steady otherwise if you're restricting all day and emotional stuff comes along you're going to fall straight off the tightrope and um you've got no resilience to deal with emotions so once you've got your physiology stable then it's starting to identify your emotional triggers um and you know i guess it could be a whole range of emotional triggers you know because i think as soon as you have dieted you start to develop a very judgmental mindset not just around food but around yourself yeah. So then when life events happen that trigger emotions and um, you can very start very quickly start to feel like I failed maybe and um you know you can start to use food to soothe to distract to punish um but again it's like start, starting to develop that awareness and sometimes you might need a professional to deal with that cuz I think sometimes you're so kind of lost in the jungle you can't see the wood for the trees and you might not People come to say to, will say to me, you know, I don't know why I'm doing this. You know, I, yeah. I don't think it is an emotional problem. Um, so yeah, that's another tip. Um, I think becoming much more self compassionate. Um, you know, that more and more research is coming out with um, compassion focused therapy, showing as well that when we are kinder to ourselves, you know, almost treat ourselves as we would a good friend. Um, that really, really, really helps. Um, and I think, again, it goes so against, you know, in our culture, there's this kind of real sort of um, attitude in a way that, you know, you just have to work really hard and drive yourself, push yourself. And, and I think as well, that's still the message on some sort of um, personal development podcasts and things like that, and the information out there. So um, that doesn't help. So, yeah, I think those are some of the kind of key tips, really. Um, self-awareness, look at your physiology, look at your emotions, self-compassion. I could give more, but I think those are really good oh. starting points for someone. Yeah, you mentioned the Ansel Keys study. And if anyone's like a nutritionist or a PT or whatever, I would highly regard going over to the Ansel Keys Minnesota study and looking at it. And I don't even know if those pictures would be allowed to put out in social media these days. I think even social media would be um, hesitant to put out the, the photos from the before and afters for, for those guys. But it's interesting from that kind of study and stuff, as you said, that they became more body conscious. They become more body aware from being in a dieting phase. And I think a lot of people do find that, that they kind of, a little bit more comparison kind of comes in. It's like, well, why are they leaner? Why are they still holding on to a little bit more muscle? And I'm, I've been there myself from doing fitness photo shoots and stuff. Like you get to a point, you're like, well, why am I losing all this on this certain area and stuff? And that's not a nice position to be in. You mentioned the word of self-compassion. And I think a lot of people, think like it's like um that they're going to turn into the buddha if they kind of go down the self-compassion route but how important is kind of self-compassion and self-worth because the self-worth thing is the driver for a lot of things for an awful lot of people and what they do they just fear of being worthy it's like an element of self-sabotage kind of comes into it like how how big a driver is that kind of self-worth in, in this health aspect of things oh sure. well i mean I, th I think it's like fundamental like i think almost everybody with an eating disorder, if you strip back the layers, deep down, they don't feel good enough about themselves. And um, through the eating disorder, it's become a way to try to feel good enough. And I think the seductive thing is, is you get kind of glimmers of feeling good enough. You know, if you become very lean and people start to validate you, um, you know, you, you kind of get a glimmer of self-worth. Um, but of course, it doesn't really, it doesn't really fill you up from within. You're always then kind of chasing more or you're thinking, oh, well, I can't trust that person's opinion because that's not how I feel because of I'm not following my plan or I'm not doing what I think I should do. So there's that real discrepancy. You know, it doesn't genuinely build self-worth. Um, so I think, yeah, working on within, relying much less on external validation, I think as well, many people with eating disorders, not just with eating disorders, in our world in general, we become very reliant on we don't on other people's opinions, on external validation, and we've kind of lost touch with that wisdom, that our own inner voice and our own ability just to kind of validate ourselves and to just and not in an arrogant way, it's just being able to recognize really genuinely these are what my strengths are, these are the things that I'm good at, you know, just believing in a way that I'm a good enough person, despite whether I'm walk so many steps or eating so many yeah. calories or you know just kind of really I am good enough as I am um and I think as well because I think a lot of people think well if I became really self-compassionate then I'd be really lazy and I I wouldn't get off the couch and you know so it's kind of like you say perhaps they kind of poo-poo it a bit or they think they're going to turn into Buddha or something but 
I often as well think say to people like think about how you would talk to a child you know like if a child's learning to ride a bike or something when they fall off you kind of you're really encouraging and warm and you, you know you say, get back on and you're really supportive and you tell them all the things they're doing well and I kind of think that's a lot of what self-compassionate being self-compassionate is about it's like being your own supporter being kind to yourself supporting yourself so you can still meet your end goals and still be a high achiever but you can do it with a lot of warmth and kind of playfulness and you know and joy and you know really um support yourself along the way rather than like being there with a stick telling yourself yeah. all the things you haven't done right which doesn't motivate you does it you know you feel hopeless um you procrastinate um all those things when you really have that super critical inner bully I love that analogy of the kid getting up and off the bike and like they just get back on because they haven't got the fear. And it's the whole thing of like embrace your inner child and kind of just go for things and, and what you want. And looking at self-compassion a point of view of rather like a lot of people could view it as like a, a selfish act rather than a selfless act. And I've never like achieved anything myself or I wouldn't say many have from berating themselves in the direction they want to go like no one's really achieved anything. They could push themselves a little bit harder. But as you said, there's a fine line of like hustle, hustle, hustle and balance. And I think we've been brought up in an era of kind of like, because social media is there, getting the validation, getting that dopamine hit, that we need to look a certain way. We need to have a business at a certain level, that it's, it's very hard to find that balance. And it's about creating that feed for yourself. And yeah. ter- like that's the biggest thing is like, if you are on social media and you are getting triggered, curate your feed and support and look at the the profiles that could help you um one of the things which we spoke about there is the likes of support and you've mentioned there about talking to a loved one how like as you said it's very difficult it can be very difficult for someone who hasn't come from an eating disorder background or hasn't got the education in it to fully understand what it is or how to support it what advice have you got from that point of view of someone has just come to you and said that they have an eating disorder and you're not sure how to kind of cope with it yourself? Sure. I think there's, um, there's a couple of things. So I think the BEAT, that's one thing I didn't mention earlier, actually, the BEAT website is a really great resource um, for carers and for sufferers of eating disorders. So really recommend that as a place to go just to educate yourself, etc. cetera. Um, then also what's really helpful um, there's something called the new Maudsley animal model, um, which is created by the Maudsley Hospital in London in their eating disorder service. And this is a model for carers to help them support someone with an eating disorder. So that's a great resource to go and read about. Um, it's um, written more for people with anorexia nervosa, perhaps speaking to a parent, but it's so relevant actually across all the eating disorders and even just like parenting teenagers and stuff it's all about you know great communication and um you know um and and I suppose just to give you a really brief overview of that it's very much saying the animal model says you know try and be the dolphin so when you're the dolphin you kind of swim alongside someone you listen you like reflect back what they're saying um you know you're affirmative and warm um And what people I think often get drawn into is being the rhino when you're really directive and like telling people, you know, just stop binging, you know, the person's not going to just stop binging or being the ostrich, completely ignoring the problem altogether, being the jellyfish who becomes like really angry, anxious, emotional. So the person will just completely withdraw from you or being the kangaroo with the joey where, um, you know, the person that's unwell starts to be treated more like with kid gloves and that can feel very sort of disempowering. So it's about being the dolphin. And I think the dolphin often feels like you're not doing anything. So I think if someone comes to you and says, I've got an eating disorder, what, you know, help me, you probably feel, oh my goodness, I need to fix this. I need to make it better. I need to like start meal prepping for you or something. And really that's not what you want to be doing. Um, and I'm talking as well, particularly in my, if you have a young child with an eating disorder, that's slightly different. But I'm talking here for like late teens to adulthood. But just actually being there, actually listening, reflecting back, affirming, being like warmly supportive in the wings is the most helpful thing you can do. And I think that's tricky because for a lot of people, it feels like, well, that's not really doing anything. But 
if you just I guess anyone listening if you think about like when you have a problem yourself and you go and tell your friend often you don't want them to fix it you just want them to listen and you want them to kind of like you know hear what you're saying and be supportive you know that's often the most helpful thing not being given a whole load of advice yeah and I think what you've said there about like you it's it's just knowing that the support is there uh, I think that's setting the foundation for them knowing that because we've mentioned the word before shame and if they know that their support is there and they're not being shamed or they're not being guilt tripped or whatever it may be I think that's a huge thing a huge important thing you mentioned in kind of adolescence and kids and stuff like that um and how to kind of help uh, like as a parent and stuff yourself how to help offspring kind of develop a healthier relationship with with foods if they do struggle have you got any kind of advice on that regard Sure. Well, I think if someone develops an eating disorder and they're sort of like under 15 or something, then they, in a way, you some the family should get quite intensive support through CAMS, you know, the, commun- the child and adolescent mental health services. Yeah. So that might be with like kind of, you know, support, support around meals and all kinds of things. So it's very different in terms of working with adults. But I think just generally trying to help a child have a healthy relationship with food. I mean, it is a minefield because I think people parents feel terrified generally about you know not wanting to mess the child's relationship with food up they don't want their child to become overweight they're terrified of getting an eating disorder but I think it's just trying to be as sort of like food neutral as possible you know to model a healthy relationship with food yourself so you know eating healthily but also not kind of banning foods having like healthy language around foods things like that not calling foods good and bad not dieting in front of your kids um, you know, just kind of, you know, helping them to have autonomy around food, make their own choices um, and talking to them as well, I guess, about stuff that comes up. If, um, you know, if, if they comment on things that they see on TikTok or something, um, you know, having open conversations. Um, so but it's a bit of a minefield. I think it's a whole kind of like probably could do like about a whole podcast on that. I know, yeah. um, <laughs> why do you think that kind of um, the eating disorders have increased in in men so much over the last little while because unfortunately the stigma has been that it's kind of like a female predominant kind of condition and stuff but why is it kind of kind of coming out in men a little bit more um i don't know either during this weird time or has it kind of been rammed down in men for so long that you can't talk about it and that's just kind of like because more people are talking about it, they feel that that's it's it's a safe haven for them or a safe place to do so yeah well i think it's really hard to know because i think the statistics as well um people are very aware that men often have an access to eating disorder services because i think you know the whole services are set up to be much more female friendly mm-hmm. you know the, the language in leaflets and stuff is much more around females um, so I wonder as well if actually the problem for eating disorders in men has actually been a lot more significant than we've ever realised, um, yeah. but it's just been underreported. And I think as well, because men often go into the eating disorder route perhaps more in the fitness, again, generalising, um, again, it can feel a bit more kind of normalised because if you're going to the gym and you're super lean and you're kind of calorie counting, it can just feel like well, yeah. it's kind of normal. This is what I do. It doesn't, it's not seen as an eating disorder. So, yeah, I, but and then I guess more recently as well, just with all the stresses of COVID and like, I guess there is more and more pressure on men as well, isn't there, to look a certain way um, where that pressure perhaps used to be more on females. I think men experience that very much too now. Um, and the last question I'm going to ask is in relation to ways to kind of improve the relationship with body image because body image is one of those massive pillars that I don't think gets enough um airtime um there's like the body body positivity movement and stuff like that there's diet culture there's all these kind of different cultures and stuff like that but what kind of tips and stuff have you got to kind of improve body image for for someone well i mean yeah i think again a huge area i mean i think one of the things is just a very simple thing but not necessarily easy is just focusing a lot less on your body I think I often ask people to sort of draw a pie chart out, you know, in terms of like to show me all the different segments in terms of how their self-worth is generated. 
And I think if you're leaning towards eating disorder or disordered eating, you usually have this massive chunk of the pie chart that is about how my body looks or how I'm, you know, what I'm eating. And then you have like these really little small segments for like the rest of your life. And um, so it's often, you know, the problem has often become in a way that you are focusing too much on your body as a means of deriving self-worth. And then that is a very, very difficult thing to win at because of everybody, even if you're a supermodel, will have some parts of their body that they don't like. And if you start paying attention to those parts and, you know, creating more thoughts, collecting more evidence about the body part you don't like, in a way, you're getting yourself caught in this very unhelpful loop where you will start to be thinking about your body more and more, and then you'll restrict your eating more. And you kind of, you know, you're kind of caught in this almost like tunnel <laughs> it's very hard to exit from so one of the things that's just really helpful is to start to think of like the bigger picture think of your values you know when you're 90 looking back on your deathbed yeah. and thinking about what's been important in your life you know how much is controlling your weight or being a certain amount of having a certain amount of body fat how much is that going to have really mattered in the overall perspective of your life because it might seem like it matters a lot today but I think usually for most people when they look at the bigger picture they realize actually that's you know, it's, it might be part of the segments of my pie, but it is not really where I want to be focusing so much time and energy on. So just a really simple way to start to have a better body image is not to focus on your body as much. Um, because of it, I guess I'm sure you know as well that people that often do bodybuilding competitions have the lowest level of body satisfaction because they become so obsessed on the minutiae yeah. of the changes in your body, you know, that it's very hard to feel satisfied. So, yeah, so, and so it's going a bit more towards body neutrality. You know, body positivity, I think, is too much for some people to, you know, completely love your body, but to just be a bit more neutral about your body and also to appreciate all the wonderful things it could do. You know, because I sometimes say to people, you know, if you suddenly, if you lost a limb tomorrow, you know, you'd lose, <laughs> suddenly lose quite a few kilos, wouldn't you? But your whole body image would be massively changed. And you yeah. wouldn't be thinking about your six pack, would you? Just be thinking, oh my goodness, I so would like to have a fully functioning body back again. Um, so I think again, like leaning to focus more on what your body can do, appreciating your body, practicing gratitude for your body. Um, I always think of like the Baz Luhrmann sunscreen song when yeah. it says, you know, like 10 years time, you know, you'll look back. And I sometimes think today, you know, if I, if I have a sort of bad body image day, so I think, well, Harry, in 10 years time, you'll probably be thinking, oh, my goodness, I had so much, so many less wrinkles. And, you know, I didn't have any aches and pains and I could run around and I would just like so would love that body back. So it's just like celebrating the body you got today, isn't it? And you know, and I'm, I'm also talking here, assuming people listening have good health. And of course, if you don't have good health and you're suffering in your body, that's a very different thing. And I really feel for you there. But for most of us, we have a healthy functioning body and um, we need to like, start tuning in more to that. because That really helps out with body image. Yeah, I think what you've said there about kind of like if you are struggling, it is important to know that there is support. Like if you're in the UK, there are there are places to go to in Ireland there's places to go to as well um and it is it's important to know that there is that support because I think a lot of people when they're in that headspace they believe that there is no support they believe that they're isolated they believe that they're on their own but knowing that someone around them or even a stranger that can just kind of like word vomit or words kind of like just say what you want without any guilt or shame and no judgment I mean that's one of the big things from someone who has gone to counselling is like you build this up in your head of oh this person's going to judge me no their job is to help you <laughs> their job yeah. isn't to judge you um but so Harriet I cannot thank you enough for for the the amazing work that you've done and the amazing work that you do with the with the podcast the eating disorder therapist um so where can people find out about yourself where can people find out about your website where can people find out about the, the podcast and how often it goes out sure so best place really to go find me straight away is Instagram so I'm um, at the eating disorder therapist with underscores in between um, yeah, my podcast is called The Eating Disorder Therapist as well. So you know, it's nice and straightforward. So you can find that on most major platforms. And my website is also theeatingdisordertherapist.co.uk. So um, yeah, just sit me into Google and I will come up. 
I'm going to put all the links in. I'll put the links into the the uh, for the podcast as well, guys, if you want to listen to it, because there's been some incredible uh, guests and, and kind of topics on that. But the most important thing is people know that there is support out there for them if you're in that position. But Harriet, thank you for, so much for, for coming on. Thanks so much, Shane. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation, something a bit different. Do go and check out Shane's details in the show notes if you would like to find out more about the valuable work he does in supporting women in fitness with improving their relationship with food and body image. So if you're not following me already, do seek me out on Instagram at the Eating Disorder Therapist. And for further support with your relationship with food, do go to my website, theeatingdisordertherapist.co.uk. And if you enjoyed this episode, I'd be so grateful if you would follow, rate and review as it helps it reach so many more listeners. Thank you so much for listening today. And I look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon. Mm